If we are in the business of designing economic institutions and financial markets for humans, we should definitely take into account what kind of animal we are. Welcome to this podcast produced by the International Monetary Fund. In this program, chimpanzee politics. And as much as we can learn about the human species and our nature, the better the institutions we will design to shape our behavior. I am Ruchir Agarwal, uh, an economist at the IMF, and I will be talking to you today about chimpanzee politics and climate change. So what is chimpanzee politics and, and how did you, as an economist, get drawn in to the world of, of primates? Chimpanzee politics is a term that was coined uh, almost 40 years ago by the primatologist uh, Franz de Waal uh, in his first book when he described the schmoozing and scheming mm -hmm. of chimpanzees and he compared it to human politicians. <laughs> and the chimpanzee politics provides a lens in, in the human fight against uh, climate change. Uh, in terms of how I got interested into the world of primates, I would say maybe there are two influences, one of the heart and uh, one of the mind. Uh, but the heart, I would say, as far as back as I can remember, I've been fascinated by animal behavior, uh, animal psychology. And I've tried to spend uh, almost every year uh, with my family, with my wife in nature, uh, observing animals. And a couple of years ago, for example, we spent some time in Chibale Forest, Uganda, observing uh, and tracking a group of chimpanzees. And in one of the unique things I would say in this piece that has been written for the Finance and Development magazine is all the photos there are from such trips that I've done over my life. So, uh, so that's the first influence. And the second influence quickly is, uh, is just of the mind is I've, I just have a deep love for evolutionary biology, the ideas from that field colors a lot of how I see the world, but also my own field of economics. How interesting. So you're a photographer as well? Not as nearly as good as I would like to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so as you uh, lay out uh, clearly in this piece, um, for animals, it's all about payoffs. Their relationships with other animals, including the chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. um, are humans any different? The answer is yes and no. Uh, so in many ways, if you compare humans and chimpanzees, the genetic overlap between humans, uh, homo sapiens and chimpanzees is 98.4%. Hmm. So we share over 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Wow. And uh, in fact, uh, Jared Diamond wrote a book, uh, the American geographer wrote a book early 90s calling humans the third chimpanzee hmm. uh, owing to this strong overlap. But in the way we are different, this 2% uh, genetic difference has led to large changes in, in how we live our lives. We have created religions, we've created modern uh, technologies, we have very complex economic systems, art, which is accounted by this 2% difference that uh, evolved in the last couple million years or so. Uh, but one of the very special things, and the reason why I focus on this in the essay is that this 2% difference also is what allows us to cooperate in a very elaborate way. It allows us to enter into these trades with, with others to go from you know what would be otherwise a lose-lose situation to a win-win situation for multiple parties. And international trade is a, is a simple example of that. Uh, so the central question that I ask in this essay is, have we humans evolved enough to cooperate and overcome the greatest threats facing us, particularly that have public goods nature, such as the climate change problem that we are facing. But humans do, in fact, cooperate a lot uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's how plans are made and essentially how the work gets done. So why is it so hard to cooperate uh, on global issues like climate change? Perhaps I start again with, uh, you know, the theme of us being just another animal. Mm. In the animal kingdom, there are two ways in which cooperation mainly happens. 
is first is kinship. People are related to each other. Mothers do some things for their children. Um, brothers do something for the sisters. So the kinship is a place where we see strong examples of cooperation, the same with humans. Second is that when there's clear, easy case of reciprocity, uh, where if I do something for you today, I know I'll get something back from you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Now, those two themes also very much apply to our own species of where we see cooperation. Where cooperation becomes really difficult are when things like global public goods are involved, where me putting an effort does not directly benefit me, but benefits uh, other people in the world or even the planet. And in this, from this perspective, climate change is one of our ultimate difficult challenges that tests our evolutionary limits. Uh, and I would say there are a few things that make climate change particularly hard. First is we have to cooperate with multiple non-kins, you know, we have to cooperate with people from many different countries, actually all the countries in the world, and many future generations. That's really hard. Uh, second thing is this very, very long time lags between when we pay the cost of cooperation, we change our behavior today, yeah. uh, and the benefits can happen way, way, way down into the future, often 40, 50, or even more years later. Um, maybe I'll just add one more thing that makes climate change a particularly hard problem to solve. That's the limit of our imagination. To solve a problem, you need to understand the problem. And climate change is a particularly hard problem to understand given the complexities, the nonlinearities, the feedbacks that are involved. Uh, first, within the climate, and the second, how that affects economic outcomes. And this really tests our ability to imagine the future as humans, which then therefore prevents uh, cooperative outcomes. Hmm. But our ability to imagine is uh, something that separates us from the primates, is it not? Definitely. I think there is some evidence that uh, primates also can imagine the future and plan in a systematic way, hmm. uh, li like humans do. But we, exactly as you say, our ability to do that is just uh, several bounds more in, in just how our brain has evolved. So we don't often see uh, economists like yourself making the link between uh, their field and the natural world. And yet climate change, as you just described, uh, makes that connection so obvious. What can economists learn from the natural world and to what extent can the field of economics, do you think, uh, help solve the climate change problem? I, I love that question. So yeah, we can definitely learn something from nature and Based on what we learn, we can definitely change our economic institutions or improve our economic institutions to reduce our impact on nature. So, on you know, uh, I'm an economist and I work on policy, uh, designing policies on a variety of issues. And one thing I learned from all this work in evolutionary biology is if we are in the business of designing economic institutions and financial markets for humans, we should definitely take into account what kind of animal we are. Uh, and this can help us overcome some of these impediments to cooperation that I've highlighted before and, and uh, build on the good within us. Are we a social animal or a selfish animal? Are we able to follow through on our promises and under what circumstances? These are the type of questions that we need to understand to both mitigate uh, our impact on climate, but also prepare for the climate's impact on us by sharing those risks, uh, what's called adaptation in the climate literature. Hmm. So uh, as much as you're interested in this world of animal psychology and uh, evolutionary biology, you are, again, an economist. Mm -hmm. And in this uh, F&D article, you talk about how some of those risks you just spoke of uh, play out in, in financial markets and how those markets can actually help mitigate some of the effects of climate change. Uh, walk us through how that works. Right. So here I would perhaps focus on the issue of adaptation. Adaptation is really, uh, you know, despite our best efforts to mitigate climate change, it is very likely that there will be some residual risk that will remain. The world will still warm in unexpected ways and 
there will be an adverse effect on that climate onto uh, human and economic activities, right? So we need to adapt to that impact. And in this role, financial markets can play a big role because we don't know today who will bear this cost, where and the nature or size of these costs. And financial markets can help us enter into mutual obligations today to share these risks that are about to happen sometime into the future. Uh, now, the problem of climate change is there are going to be large parts of the world that are going to be hit by the same shock, right? For instance, large areas in the tropics may face the risk of flooding of their lower-lying coastal areas. And so because there will be very large correlated shocks, it will be very important to share these risks with other geographies that may potentially escape such fate. Uh, you know, in chimpanzee world, food sharing between chimpanzees work very well when there's enough food for the whole group, uh, regardless of which chimpanzee has been successful in the hunt on any given day. But if the total amount of food available to the group is not enough, then we face into problems, then that chimpanzee tribe will probably need to start cooperating with other tribes that may have food on that given day. And this is exactly the problem financial markets face when they try to share risks for climate change. And so in this respect, a challenge for financial markets is to design a centralized uh, market for hedging risks that brings together actors from all these different parts of the world to design innovative contracts for risk sharing. And this risk sharing has to happen now rather than in the future, because as we learn already who will be the winners and losers from climate change, then the incentive to enter into risk-sharing contracts will go down. I think one of the takeaways that one gets after reading your article is that it is human nature to uh, focus on things that um, bring instant satisfaction uh, in some form or another. Mm -hmm. um, how do you convince humans to consider doing things uh, that may only pay off far into the future, uh, like you know, using fewer fossil fuels, for example? You know, in, in many ways, humans already have an advantage over other animals. Um, in many experiments show that non-humans are discounting uh, future rewards much more than humans do. Mm. Uh, pigeons, primates, it's been seen across a large group of animals. So humans have an advantage, but at the same time, what we find is humans that lack a good understanding of issues they tend to heavily discount the future as well. Um, and climate change here is in particular, exactly as you say, Bruce, is a particular problem because of the very long lags between the mitigation action you take today and the impact of that action, which can happen decades into the future. And this is an issue of salience. Because the benefits are less salient, you often see uh, many people care less about those issues of, of climate change. Uh, and one way we can offset this in design of economic institutions is to explicitly place weight on the welfare of future generations in every cost-benefit analysis that underpins government, corporate, or private actions. Uh, several countries already do this. An example is from Bhutan. As you may know, Bhutan has a uh, institution called the Gross National Happiness Commission, and the goal of this commission is to essentially steer all national policies and plans towards the principles enshrined in the gross national happiness of, of Bhutan. And, and this approach could be adopted for a broader set of issues that last way beyond the electoral cycle. And uh, concretely, for example, the IMF Article 4, which are these annual reports we write for every country, has a five-year forecast horizon. We do all our forecasts, growth numbers, uh, unemployment numbers, from a five-year perspective. But if we were, as an institution, looking at 10, 20-year horizon projections, it will not only change our how we do the forecast, but it will also change the questions we ask. And this is a very long-term perspective. So basically making us think more creatively about the decisions we're making today, what is the impact of that into the future generations? Ruchir Agarwal, 
a senior IMF economist. Um, congratulations on this uh, fabulous article and um, thanks for sharing your research. Thank you very much, Bruce. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Look for Ruchir's article titled Chimpanzee Politics in the September edition of Finance and Development magazine. The entire issue is about climate change. Check it out at imf.org slash FND or download the Finance and Development app. And look for other IMF podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at IMF underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. Thanks for listening. <laughs>